We're just approaching the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum and gift shop here in Pepin, Wisconsin. We got here kind of late in the day and they're only open for another 15 or 20 minutes. But we're going to walk inside, take a quick look around and see what uh, they have for us to see. So that's her travels. That'll give you an idea of what we're going to do, too, because well, we started off in Green Bay, and we're now in Pepin, and tomorrow we're heading over to Walnut Grove. Day after tomorrow we want to get to DeSmet, South Dakota, and after we have now come inside this small Lure and Wilder Museum in Pepin, Wisconsin. I'd zoom out a little bit more, but the camera is zoomed out as far as it will go. So, nice old sewing machine. Singer sewing machine by the name I can see on the treadle. You even got a little pretend part of a steamboat or a riverboat there. Okay, this is uh, the building next door to the museum that I was just in. And this is another part of, I guess, the Laura Engels Wilder Museum. Now, this just is a gift. Now, I had another sale sitting down at the top of the So we started out in the museum on the left. We're now in the museum on the right. And the one in the middle is still under construction. This is the site of the Little House Wayside on County Trunk Highway CC, about seven miles north of Pepin, Wisconsin. This is the, uh, the setting for the, the book of hers called The Little House in the Big Woods, and this is uh, her birthplace. Uh, the cabin that you see here is not the original cabin. This is a modern uh, reproduction, supposed to look like the cabin of the times. Based on what we've seen at other uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder's sites of the cabins or the houses that they had, I suspect that this cabin is much bigger than the one that they actually had, especially considering that um, her father basically had to build the cabin all by himself. This is an awful lot of work for one person to build. So just take a look around and uh, get a feel for the area. It, it's no longer the uh, the little house in the big woods. It's more like the little house in uh, set in amongst a number of cornfields along a county highway.
So we're in Walnut Grove, Minnesota. We came here on Highway 14, which parallels this railway. It appears to be very much a grain railway. We're going to walk over that way to the Laura Angles Wilder Museum and Gift Shop in Walnut Grove, Minnesota. There's the proof that it's Walnut Grove. It says so on the water tower. And this is the inside of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum gift shop at Walnut Grove. It's obviously much more uh, modern looking than the one in Pepin. I hope so you don't have to smack yourself lucky in. So this is the depot building part of the Laura Wilder Museum in Walnut Grove. Okay, I'm back outside the depot building, which I'm just going to pan around and show you. That's the depot building that we are in. According to the documentation inside the depot, the railway here was originally built as part of Chicago and Northwestern. We're currently inside the the building that at this museum is called Grandma's House. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, but it's not all related to Laura Wilder. Uh, but this desk is, this is her writing desk, and it is the desk at which all of the Little House books were written by her. So that's what makes this part of this particular building the most interesting. There's instructions on how to pack a covered wagon with everything that a family needs, including what's like a, couple, a little kid in a wagon, that, the bed of which is four by ten. And here's a replica, possibly a real antique wagon. I don't know what's inside the building though. See, they've definitely got it packed. So we're coming up on the site of the original dugout uh, from on the banks of Plum Creek. 
this area is privately owned, but the owners of the land have been very generous in allowing this little right of way for those of us who are absolutely fascinated by Laura and her life. Very generous at the cost of five dollars a car. They're allowing access. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're, they're making money off it. They're making money, but they provided yeah, the make access. It, <laughs> make it off of uh, their corn as well. I'm imagining we're driving alongside of Plum Creek down there. Don't know if you can see it real good, but... And now we're coming up on the parking area. Plum Creek. We are on the banks of Plum Creek. Creek again. Yep, there's the table land that she was talking about. Mm -hmm. On her way to the swimming hole when she was a babe and wasn't supposed to go there alone. And was stopped by a badger. Except she didn't know it was a badger. It was just a nasty snarler thing. Laura's dugout home on the banks of the Plum Creek. The Charles Ingalls family's dugout home was located here in the 1870s. This depression is all that remains since the roof caved in years ago. The prairie grasses and flowers here grow much as they did in Laura's time, and the spring still flows nearby. Makes sense to me. And if you ignore the grain elevator off in the distance, it probably looked very much the same a hundred years ago. Ingalls Homestead, Laura's living prairie. Here on this land, the hopes and dreams of the Charles Ingalls family came true. 
We hope to help you enjoy the wonder of this prairie while learning about homestead. When Congress passed the Homestead Act of 1862, land fever spread like a prairie fire. Hopeful settlers from many different parts of the world looked upon the vast sea of prairie grass rippling in the wind and yearned to claim a piece of this free land and make it their own. Charles and Caroline Ingalls and their two daughters, Mary and Laura, lived in the big woods of Wisconsin near Pepin. Charles was stricken with a serious case of land fever. Before he found a cure, his family traveled by covered wagon over 1,550 miles to the little house on the prairie near Independence, Kansas, to the banks of Plum Creek in Minnesota, to Burrough, Iowa, back to Walnut Grove, and finally here to Dakota Territory on Ingalls Homestead near the little town on the prairie. Pa sang a popular song of the era. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. Oh, finally to this country and have no fear of harm. Our Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. In the summer of 1879, Pa, as Laura called him, came to dismay working on the railroad. His girls, Ma, Mary, Laura, Carrie, and Grace met him in the fall. They spent their first winter in the surveyor shanty on the shores of Silver Lake. In February 1880, Pa picked this quarter section of land to be their homestead. Pa thought it was right in every way. It was located near the town site, so the girls could walk to school. It had upland for hay and good farm ground. It was next to the big slough, where Pa could harvest hay in a dry year. Pa met the homestead requirements since he was over 21 years of age, farmed over 10 acres, and built a little shanty that would be their home over the next five years. Charles and Caroline made good on their bed with Uncle Sam. In 1886, proof papers were filed and published. For a mere $16 in filing fees, this 160-acre farm became theirs. This is the um, visitor center gift shop at the DeSmet site and they've got a small modern camping area. Uh, this building basically looks like an old schoolhouse. It's set up as a little museum. There's an antique covered wagon in there that you can look at and a few other artifacts. Then down the hill right behind that is where the um, shanty and the dugout house uh, both are. We're now looking down at the area of the uh, Wilder Homestead and over at the uh, horse barn. Then just panning to the right here to see all of his 16 acres, excuse me, 160 acres. Um, they've set up this tower so you can get a better view of the land. And um, we'll zoom in down to the, the far corner uh, the far southwest corner uh, that where that wagon and the building are that's a little schoolhouse that was moved here in uh, the late 1950s or 60 or 1960 um, onto this property to show what a one room schoolhouse uh, really looked like that one was used until the 1950s so th this is basically the overview of the Ingalls property all the way back to that little white church in the distance. That's the other northeast corner of the land. Somebody's messing with the stove. Thank you. 
central heating. It's in the center of the building. Yep. Okay, and here's the dugout. I'm sure this is a replica, but we saw the one on the site of the dugout on Plum Creek, and this is probably about what it looked like when it was in use. So we've got a door and one small window. And as you can see, it's really built right into the side of a hill here. And there's grass up on the roof. You can easily walk by and miss it. Um, built into the side of the hill, but not quite as nice as a hobbit hole, that's for sure. There's one in here. Oh, there's one. Somewhere. Over here we have, uh, we're looking at it from the back, the stage setup where they have a Laura Angles Wilder pageant. I guess it's basically a play of one sort or another that they do. There was one of those in um, Walnut Grove, too, for the last few. Or they do it for a few weekends every summer in Walnut Grove. I don't know what the schedule is here. But I imagine you can buy tickets and sit here of an evening. And uh, they probably do some reenactment of... Uh, different parts of Laura Ingalls Wilder's life and books. That's my guess at least. So. Teaching the kids how to do the laundry. There's a replica of what they call their claim cabin. And I guess the original cabin was only that part with the porch, and then this rest is an add-on, doubling the size of the building. But they've got a kitchen, two bedrooms, and a parlor in this new part. New, this second add-on. <coughs> the bedrooms are probably about six foot by eight foot. Sleeps four. So, get an idea of a small um, homestead cabin. to be a horse barn. Could well just be for these small ponies, which I am. I have to guess they like the little kids here.
that they've got for their covered wagon line. Inside the horse barn, you can see they've got a couple of nests. I have no idea what kind of birds they are, but they definitely are feeding. Oh, and here comes our, our ride. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So we have four volunteer drivers, or do we have any more? Any of you want to drive the wagon? Mommy. Well, if anybody changes their mind, you can drive on the way back as well. We'll have two people drive for now on the way there and then two on the way back, okay? Yep. Back. Back. All around. All around. Good boys. Good boys. All right. So you can start driving the wagon. So here are the reins. And you're doing good until something goes wrong, okay? <laughs> How is everybody doing? My name is Mano, and uh, our horse, our horse today on the left is Elwin, and our mule on the right is uh, Festus. So, and Elvin, Elvin is a Percheron, which is a French draft, uh, draft breed of horse. And uh, as I said, Festus is a mule. Now, does, does anybody know how you get a mule? It's a horse and a donkey. That's right, that's right. So Festus, he has a uh, daddy donkey and a mommy, uh, mommy horse. But mules can't get any babies themselves. So. Uh, there, the wagons that the Ingalls family and other settlers were traveling were way smaller than this one. Easy boys. Uh, it would only be four boards wide, so one, two, three, four, and five bows long, so one, two, three, four, five, wow. right there. Like the, like the wagon in, in the white building on top of the hill. So it was pretty small, and they had to carry all their belongings in it. So where do you think the kids would sit most of the time? In the very back of like this little one. If there was room for that, because um, most of the time the, the families took turns walking beside the wagon with another one. I guess we can figure out what we were up there must have been. Or a Lauren knew how to drive. Oh, they're doing good.